The unrivaled master of the landscape panoramas, who is a bleaching field in the foreground, and the Bavo church at the horizon, is the prolific Jacob van Ruisdael. He is reckoned to have produced about 45 of such views of Haarlem. These views of Haarlem even got a nickname, Haarlempjes, or in English, Little Haarlems, Haarlem written in the old spelling. A kind of specialization within a specialization. Recently, one of the about 15 known Haarlempjes is sold for six million dollars. Notice the Baroque looming dark cloud above Haarlem. Obviously, he could easily find buyers for these small Haarlempjes. They could find a place in any Dutch middle class house of the time. This one, for instance, is about 36 by 45 centimeters or 14 by 18 inches. But where did Van Ruisdael sit when he sketched his famous Haarlempjes? Was that on Rembrandt's location? In Van Ruisdael's case, the question seems not too difficult because his rendering of the Bavo is often precise making conclusions about points of the compass in the picture possible. This drawing by the artist Peter Zanredam, who we will meet again later in this video, and by the sapphire Peter Wills, it is the preparatory study for a print. The compass points are drawn in the center of the church. It shows that the nave, with a small deviation, goes from east to west. Both transepts lie more or less on the north-south line. This in mind makes it possible to infer the direction of Van Ruisdael's view of the church. From the precision of the north transept, we can infer that Van Ruisdael sees the church from about the north northwest. Rembrandt sees the church more from the northwest as indicated before and as can be inferred from the depicted position of the westward nave and the north transept. Compared to Van Ruisdael's north transept, more of the roof of this transept can be seen. So Van Ruisdael set probably more to the north. This painting is from the early 1660s. This is a close-up of the Bavo of another Haarlempje by Van Ruisdael, dating from about 1665. And this one, shown earlier, dates from 1670-75. All three churches are seen from a similar direction, from about the north northwest. So apparently Van Ruisdael painted the church in all those years from the same direction, the same location. Rembrandt's location Lindenheuvel on the satellite photo is indeed in the northwest of the Bavo. Could it be that Van Ruisdael sketched Haarlem from the kopje? This dune is now 43 meters high and with the Belvedere 52 meters, offering a great panoramic view of Haarlem and the sea.
This still of our zoom of the Bavo is made from the top of the Belvedere. Later we shall return to this video made on that spot. Comparison with the still shows that Van Ruisdael's Bavo is seen somewhat more from the north. Notice the slight difference between the surfaces of the roof of the northern transept. Like Rembrandt, also Van Ruisdael depicted the church a little out of proportion. Did perhaps Van Ruisdael choose the highest dune of the region, about one and a half kilometer more to the north, the Brederode Berg, the mountain of Brederode, no more than two meters higher than the Kopje, thus 45 meters above sea level. This is the Brederode Berg in all its glory. More an Alp than a dune, a watercolor by Peter Barbiers. Sadly, at present the dune is completely covered with trees, so there is no possibility to see the Bavo from the top. But fortunately, in 1792, Jan Bulthuis made this Haarlempje in watercolor from the top of the Brederode Berg. At the left is the Belvedere, a little multicolored Chinese temple that stood there some years. According to the position of the northern transept, it is evident that Bulthuis saw the Bavo church more from the north than Van Ruisdael. The Brederode Berg is named after Brederode, a 13th century castle definitely ruined during the siege of Haarlem in 1572. These ruins are painted from a dune top with the Bavo church at the horizon, one of the most northern viewing points of a Haarlempje. The painting an extensive landscape with the ruins of Brederode Castle and the skyline of Haarlem is attributed to Jan van Kessel. On the 17th century map shown before, the Bavo is on the right and the ruins of the Brederode Castle are on the left. It was indeed possible to see from a dune top the Bavo church at the left of the ruins of Brederode. Yet it was possible to check another viewing point of Haarlem skyline, some 600 meters north of the Kopje, in the park of Caprera, near the pond with the same name. We took our life in our hands and made this zoom of the Bavo from a tree. Still, this vantage point is just not northerly enough. From the same tree we filmed the pond. And at the lake we filmed the row of dunes, on one of which Van Ruisdael might have sketched several of his views of Haarlem. One of his most beautiful Haarlempjes hangs in the art house in Zurich. We see the bleaching grounds with the linen spread out for bleaching, this time next to a fan, beautifully reflecting the sky. If our suppositions are right, then the fan might be a depiction of the pond of Caprera. So, Jacob van Ruisdael probably sat somewhere on the row of dunes near the pond of Caprera. A terrain map using color to indicate changes in the elevation is projected onto the satellite photo to make these dunes visible. This Haarlempje, seen from about the north northwest by Van Ruisdael, is in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. It is assumed 
that a house with two chimneys hidden behind trees is the bakehouse of which the location is known. This house was inhabited by owners of a bleaching company. In a very similar version, residing in the Mauritz House The Hague, shown earlier, the same house in the same position is present. Even in this version, this time by Van Ruisdaal's surmised pupil Jan van Kessel, the two chimneys of the bakehouse stand out above the trees. Although Van Ruisdaal changed the landscape of his Haarlem views continuously, the fixed position of the bakehouse to the right of the Bavo church suggests the topographical accuracy. This position of the house relative to the church on the painting is supported by the actual location of the house on the satellite photo, seen from the Caprera vantage point. It is on the right of the Bavo. Long before Van Ruisdaal depicted the house, one of the owners of the house and the bleachery was portrayed with his family, probably by Gerrit Klaas Bleker. According to family lore, this black and white copy of the painting shows on the right a towering dune, part of the estate. This is the bakehouse in 1733. We recognize the shape of the roof and the characteristic chimneys, but now there are three instead of two. Apparently the house underwent a considerable extension. But Van Ruisdaal did not always depict the skyline of Haarlem from the Caprera location, as this painting shows. The Bavo is vaguely visible at the horizon on the far right. The ruins in the center, brightly lit by the sun, are the remains of the castle Huis der Cleve, Cleve's house, we saw earlier in this video, still intact. In the foreground is a pond. This drawing by Roland Rochman, dating from circa 1646, shows that Van Ruisdaal did not invent these ruins. Also, the topography is correct. The road next to the ruin still exists. On this blauw map from 1650, with the north on top, the location of Huis der Cleve is indicated. The Bavo stands in the very center of the city. Van Ruisdaal's usual viewing point is near what is now called the Pond of Capera. The viewing point of the present panorama is in this case somewhat more to the south, past the Kopje. By the way, Rembrandt's surmised location when he etched the Goldweyers field was still further south. But our quest is not over yet, for Van Ruisdaal also painted the Bavo seen from the south of Haarlem. Several of such paintings are known. This one is of a private collection. The western side of the nave is now on the left side of the church. The southern transepts western part is lit by sunlight. Comparison with the church seen from the north-northwest shows the difference. From this location the church is more or less seen from the south-southwest. Two other examples of a panorama with the Bavo seen from a southern vantage point. On the left an earlier shown version residing in San Diego, California, 
and on the right a version to be found in Philadelphia. Notice the similarity of the two houses and the crosswise little barn in both paintings. Van Ruisdaal seems to play with the positions of these buildings in the landscape. Just like the northern panoramas, the southern panoramas are seen from a high location in the dunes. But where was Van Ruisdaal's viewing point precisely? Going from Harlem to the south-southwest, there are no dunes nowadays. However, in the 17th century there was a strip of dunes in the village Heemstede. These dunes are in the course of centuries dug off. In the neighborhood of that location was a high dune called the Trappenberg, the Stairs Mountain, and this dune seems a plausible vantage point. Close to that dune was an inn called the Thirsty Pit. This drawing of the inn is made by Simon Fokker in the 18th century when the inn was a meeting point of artists who sketched there on plein air. This view of Harlem seen from the south is by John Kessel. The bavo shimmers through the low hanging clouds. Also Jan Vermeer van Haarlem II depicted a view of Haarlem seen from that southern location. So Van Ruisdaal was certainly not the only artist painting Haarlem from a southern viewpoint. Vermeer's depiction possesses the characteristics of Van Ruisdaal's approach. His horizon is somewhat higher. On the left are two men. The sitting figure seems to sketch the landscape on a sheet of paper. Could it be the master himself? And indeed, there is some overlapping with Van Ruisdaal's picture, in particular the row of trees in the middle ground straight behind the Jews in the foreground. But the dunes on the spot were dug off, the land was sold to a rich citizen of Amsterdam, the inn was torn down, trees were planted, and a white plastered mansion arose, called Kenema Oort. This lithography of the house is by Peters Luchters. The house was demolished and rebuilt. Finally, the usual thing happened. A prosaic apartment complex was built on the former estate. The gateposts were retained. Van Ruisdaal's Haarlempjes are unparalleled in their dramatic depiction of the vastness of nature, the majesty of a clouded sky above a flat strip of earth, and the insignificance of mankind in that infinite landscape. What we have noticed is that his Haarlempjes are in essence geographical correct, only in the details they deviate from reality. At the horizon on the right there is a pen stroke of water, one of the great lakes at the east and south of Haarlem, in those days not impoldered, lakes whose growth presented a continuing danger to the surrounding towns. This map shows the Netherlands in the 17th century. In the following centuries many lakes were drained 
a new land was reclaimed from the sea. This height map of the Netherlands shows that it is a geographically low-lying country with about 20% of its area located below sea level. The highest point is the Vaalse Berg, Mount Vaals, a hill only 322.7 meters, 1059 feet. This is the satellite overview of the Netherlands, a country with more than 60 million inhabitants. In 6051, the phantom of inundation became reality. A northwestern storm, together with springtide at full moon, resulted in two breaches in the sea dike just close to Amsterdam. Some polders were inundated and a part of Amsterdam was flooded. It shocked the city population and several artists depicted the disaster. Apparently Jan van Gooyen came some days later on site. On the dike some curious sightseers at the scene. The artist Jan Asselijn was an important painter of Italianate landscapes which explains his use of warm colors. The tempestuous sky and blown up coats of the men show that the storm has not died down yet. But Willem Schellings depicts the actual drama, the breaching of the dike. The onlookers are friends yet. In the background are some church towers of Amsterdam, although in reality they stood much farther away. The summit of drama is presented by Roland Rochman. A group of figures are trapped on a piece of dike in the center, with onlookers on either bank. Three centuries later, sea level has risen 10 centimeters, in 1953 a flooding disaster took place on a far greater scale with more than 1,800 casualties. This happened particularly in the province of Zeeland in the southwest of the Netherlands. Aan de kust bij Schavenzande dreigt de groot gevaar. Hier had het water een gat geslagen in de duinen. Met man en macht werd er gewerkt om dit gat te dichten en met succes. Bij Capelle in West-Brabant stonden de militairen voor een praktisch onuitvoerbare taak. Hier had het water zulke enorme bressen in de dijken geslagen dat er geen houden meer aan was. Ook burgerarbeiders werden ingeschakeld. Meer dan 100.000 hectare vruchtbare grond werden door het zoute water van de zee overspoeld en daardoor in enkele uren voor lange tijd onbruikbaar gemaakt. Van de veestapel kon vooral in de getroffen gebieden van Zeeland maar weinig worden gered. Tientallen dorpen werden overstroomd en van de buitenwereld afgesloten. Een groot deel van de gemeente Stavenisse op Tolen is volledig verwoest. Voor zover men thans kan overzien zijn ook hier 300 mensen verdronken. In Oost-Zeeuws-Vlaanderen werd het gebied rond Ossenisse en Hontenisse door het woedende water uit de Schelde blank gezet. The whole nation was shocked and immediately an ambitious plan was developed to raise the dikes. And after almost 50 years, in 1997, the Delta works were declared finished. This is the Easter Scout storm surge barrier, the largest of all works. But the sea still rises and the land mass beds down. Due to climate change, and relative sea level rise, a rise in the North Sea is predicted of 1.3 meters by 2100. So the Netherlands has to stand a continuous uphill battle against the sea. <laughs>